This is our first TL University uh, to make everybody that's with us a specialist, a guru on uh, a fascinating destination of Mongolia. So again, I'm super excited to have you all join us. We have participants joining us from Mexico, from Brazil, from South America, from US, Canada. So thank you so much for joining us. We're very excited. As you saw on the first screen, um, our TL uh, University is gonna be made out of four sessions. So each session is gonna dive into a different aspect of Mongolia. Uh, if you're just joining now, Anna, if you wanna share that screen again. So here you can have an idea. We're gonna today dive into the introduction to Mongolia. We have Jausa, the, the, the one and only, the founder of Nomadic Expeditions and Three Camel Lodge. So we're very fortunate to, to have the, the the guru give us this first lesson. We will then on June 30th dive into the festivals of Mongolia, July 7th, the nomadic culture and arts of Mongolia, and the last uh, lesson or session on July 14th about the Three Camel Lodge and the highlights of the Gobi Desert. So we want to encourage everybody that's with us to try to join us for all four sessions. They're going to be short and sweet, 30 minutes, dive in a lot of content. For those that are able to watch and participate in all four sessions, there is an incentive, a 15% commission for all bookings done in 2021 for 2022. Um, and we will also issue a, a badge of uh, being an expert in, Mon in Mongolia, which a lot of our partners like to share on their websites, on their emails, to really showcase you as being knowledgeable on this unique destination. So without further ado, um, we have here as part of our team, um, I wanna just make sure I introduce you, obviously Jalsa, the founder. I think Anna, you can stop sharing the screen so everybody can see the faces. Um, so we have Jalsa as the founder with us, which is uh, very, very important. We have Undra, who's the president of Nomadic Expeditions. She's your go-to for all questions, all doubts on, as well as Sanjay, who is another, expert not only it's important to highlight not only mongolia but they also work with additional destinations like bhutan and tibet um and and so forth so do you know reach out to their team for for information on india and uh, some other destinations but we're going to focus right now on mongolia nikita also part of the team um, and I'll introduce you quickly to, to the team supporting Nomadic Expeditions with TL Portfolio. We have Ana Luisa, who is your contact for uh, the US and Canada. Um, I think those from Brazil know Paula, uh, who's your contact in Brazil, Andrea in Mexico. And if there's all things go wrong, you always have Ana, who is overseeing all the markets. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, Jalsa, I'm going to throw it to you. You have a very exciting presentation, which we're looking forward to, to seeing. And again, thank you so much for joining us uh, today and hopefully for all the upcoming sessions as well. Well, thank you, Tina. It's a, certainly a pleasure to be here with all of you and our team and, and the TL portfolio team, which is now our team, part of our family. Uh, I'll start by sharing the screen, I guess. And uh, is this the way under right here? Which one? Okay. okay, there we go. You have to push. Okay, I did that. There we go. Thank you okay. very much. And then you play. And so, uh, so anyway, to start, is this coming up okay, Tina? Just to make sure. Yeah, it's coming great. You might want to share it full screen. I think Lundra can help you. So you get, if you can put the play. No, play yeah. screen, we got to do. Yeah, the play button on top. The play button will that take one. a full screen? Yeah. OK, great. Oops. That's it. There we go. So it's a pleasure to be here, everyone. And thank you for joining us. My name is Jalsa. As uh, Tina introduced me, uh, I'm Mongolian-American. And I was born and raised in the first Mongolian community in the Western Hemisphere, which is in Monmouth County, New Jersey. Back in 1951 and 52, about 500 Mongolians showed up in the US. And that's where I was born and raised, the first Buddhist uh, Lamas Temple in America, and Mongolian was my first language growing up even in the US. And in 1990, it went through a transformation, a peaceful revolution into a, uh, a democracy from 70 years of communism. So I had the great privilege in having contact with the few Mongolians that were in the US, 
from the mission to the United Nations, we maintained contact during that period of time from 1952 when we arrived. And my, my uncle, I was born later, but my uncle, my mother and parents and relatives were in touch. So I, I played a role and I was invited by one of the first political delegations and I went to Mongolia in 1990 and they asked me to help promote travel and tourism. And you'll see some of the images that compelled me to continue this as a, a labor of love for the last 30 plus years. So you'll see some images here. It doesn't seem to be playing. I'll be sharing much more with you, but uh, it'll give you a glimpse. We'll get dig deeper into it. This is just a clip uh, recently uh, taken of me. You can tell I look identical. It's uh, from 1996, actually. Uh, there was a documentary with Land Rover of uh, North America, and it's not playing at all, but you can just listen to the clip. And what is interesting is what has not changed after all these years from 1996. Uh, bear with me with the technical issues here. I believe there's so many of them. I believe that, that it's a combination of many, many items, but uh, I guess to try to sum them up or, or pinpoint them is the culture. It's a, a Buddhist, uh, Tibetan Buddhist culture, and, and it's intertwined, the, the religion is intertwined with the culture. It's a democracy. It's a, gained notoriety because of its recent political transformations. It's probably the greatest, largest, expansive, pristine environment left in the world that's got a, a horse-based nomadic population that's about 40% of the total population. So uh, the, the people living this type of lifestyle don't endanger the environment they live uh, in, in conjunction with it. So to give you an idea of the expanse of Mongolia, uh, Mongolia is essentially the, the size of uh, it's half the length of the United States or the size of all of Western Europe. I like to tell Texans it's twice the size of Texas. And it's a vast country. Uh, you can see the statistics uh, north to south and south, uh, east to west. It's uh, literally 1,400 miles, uh, more than 1,400 miles in length. And it's uh, close to 700, uh, 800 miles in, in north to south. <clears throat> this is uh, the, the, the entire country has about 6,500 miles of paved road whereas Manhattan alone has 8,000 miles. When you think about an expanse that's so wide, you can travel a half of an hour outside of the city and feel like you're going back in time and see untouched territory. The whole population of the country is only 3.3 million and nearly 30% of them uh, are herders. The capital city is home to almost 1.8 million people out of the 3.3. So more, more than half live in the capital. So when you get to the countryside, you'll see wide open spaces. It's known as the land of the eternal blue sky. And it's, it's evident why we have almost 270 sunny days a year. Though many of them are in the winter as well, which can be quite cold. But in the summers and the spring and fall, it's quite beautiful. Uh, Fahrenheit 60s to 80s, 90s in the summer. We have uh, the herds we have of horses are everywhere. 3.3 million people, but over 70 million livestock. And you can see we're quite fond of horses. There are more horses than, than people in Mongolia. And it's uh, something that goes back to our culture, part of uh, the whole horse-based nomadic pastoral existence where people live with their herds and sheep. And they still, as I said, 30% of the population will still move their gers, as we call them, or yurts as they're known in the West. They'll move them three or four times a year to winter pastures, summer pastures. And you know, you, you get to see these expanses of people living in harmony with nature. As I said before, they, they live this pristine lifestyle and they don't really harm the environment. They live in conjunction with it. They, they raise their animals. It's, it's, uh, it's an amazing thing to be able to go back in time. As I said, since there's no paved roads, we have modern vehicles, we have land cruisers, air conditioned for our travelers that people have, but we also arrange extreme adventures. But for the mainstream and for the majority of our travelers who are adventurers and explorers, we, we can create comforts, you take them out on, on in-depth explorations, meeting local families, uh, genuine interactions. These are experiences that really change uh, people's lives. We've seen this transformational uh, effect on so many and it's an infectious place. The capital of Ulaanbaatar is the main hub 
and because of the, the old socialist system, that is still the hub for travel to different uh, province centers where we can then from there have our vehicles waiting to take you further in depth or off the beaten path, even further off the beaten path. You know, Mongolia is one of those places where it's always been connotated as somewhere they used to say in the West, uh, he's in outer Mongolia. It meant uh, they were in outer space or off the grid. And so that's quite accurate. But imagine going in places in Mongolia that Mongolians uh, have a desire, life, lifelong wish to go visit, for example, the far West or the Eastern grasslands. Well, in the north, Mongolia encompasses three major different ecosystems, totally different and diverse from one another. In the north, we have a series of lakes and rivers and, and mountains rich in phosphates. This lake, Lake Hovsgol, is one of the deepest lakes in the world. It's fed by the same rivers that flow north and feed Lake Baikal, the largest lake on earth, which holds 20% of all fresh water. This is much smaller than Lake Baikal, yet it's in the top 300 or 400 lakes and surface area in the world. And it's, it's quite deep, it's over 600 feet deep, but you can see boulders uh, nearly hundred feet down. And the water is so clean that we kayak on this lake and literally can dip a cup of water into the lake while we're kayaking and drink out of it. So it's a wonderful place. We've done horse treks so we do set up remote camps for people. It's also become a popular domestic uh, location. So we actually visit places, set up uh, customized trips for to visit and camp on the banks of some of these rivers. And when we say camp, we'll set up field uh, yurts or gens, as we call them, uh, absolute comfort showers, toilets, bio toilets. All of our work is done uh, zero impact. So here we have, those are the mountains in the north and the rivers and, and the forests. Uh, the northern part of Mongolia is a forested area. It's about, forests only cover about 10 or 12% of the surface area of the country which is a continuation of the taiga, the largest forest in the world from Siberia that extends into the upper quarter of the country. Now we travel all the way to the far west. This is the farthest west province in Mongolia, Bainolgi. And it's uh, famous because it borders four countries. It's Mongolia, Kazakhstan, Russia, and China converge right at the edge of that border. It's separated from Kazakhstan by about less than 40 miles of Russian territory technically. So the tallest mountain in Mongolia is called Mount Huitin. Huitin means cold, and uh, that's in the western border. So Mongolians uh, dream of going to these places. So these are some of the places we'll also set up remote luxury camps for our clients. This is during summer months. You'll see just unbelievable rich terrain and, and flora and fauna. You know. Imagine going to places with lakes the size of Tahoe and not seeing another human being. It's, it's truly a, an amazing experience. That westernmost province is also home to the eagle hunters, the Kazakh eagle hunters. These Kazakhs are Mongolians. They've been living in Mongolia for close over two centuries from the 1800s. And they, they preserved this art of falconry with golden eagles, the only ones left in the world that were doing it. Now it's had a resurgence. Back in the early, uh, late 90s, I met with them and we, you'll hear more about it in uh, our upcoming university talk uh, about festivals in Mongolia. But I'm proud to say I, I was inspired to help uh, found and, and start and fund the, the Golden Eagle Festival, which has evolved. We, we did it not for tourism, we did it to help preserve an ancient tradition. There were only 20 or 30 families that had eagles that were training them in the world. It was abolished in Kazakhstan. So this Kazakh population that lived in Mongolia preserved this. And so we started the, tri the, the festival and it's over 22 years and uh, you'll hear more about it, uh, but it's just amazing they've preserved it and it's grown. But we also have, uh, we're compelled to make sure the impact because of the popularity on the eagles and the local population of eagles and, and the way they practice the tradition is still not harmful to the, the, the eagle population and also the other wildlife that they hunt. If we travel from the western part of the country, we go to Harhorn. It's, uh, it's been popularized in series on Netflix with uh, Marco Polo. Marco Polo visited the court of Kublai Khan, the grandson of Chinggis Khan. And Chinggis, uh, Chinggis Khan built his capital of his empire, the largest contiguous empire in the world in the 13th century. And this was the ancient capital, Karakorum. These buildings are part of a monastery that the last theocratic ruler of the country built. His name was Zanabazar. He was uh, the, he was a, uh, 
a devout Buddhist and he was a famous sculptor and architect. So he built a series of temples and monasteries throughout the country. This was the largest one. It has 108 stupas that surround it. During the communist purges, many of the buildings were destroyed. We have a wonderful abbot who's the new abbot of this. He's an amazing meditation expert. He has a small meditation center on top of a mountain. He'll meet with our clients. They, they, they just love him. He studied 50 different forms of meditation. But so these are the only buildings that survived the purges. There are three main buildings. But he's now, it's now an active monastery again, thanks to him. And he's a, a one-man social program in the, in the central province there. Just below these rocks are his small meditation, a one-room meditation center. He'll spend two months sitting on the roof of it meditating. He's, he's a truly amazing individual. That is the Orchen River Valley below. That's now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The ancient ruins, and there are two museums, one was Japanese funded and one was Turkish funded that are in this province center, in this uh, Sum center, township center. And th this area was rich. It was part of the silk routes, the tea routes. This was uh, obviously the capital of the, uh, for 300 years, the Mongol Empire until Hublai Han, the grandson of Chinggis Han, moved the capital to Beijing. Uh, people don't realize that, and that became the Yuan dynasty. So this area, the museum, they've unearthed Scythian art, prehistoric Mongolian art, the Hunu art. It's just uh, an amazing treasure trove from pre 13th century and even Bronze Age. This is another amazing story about Mongolia. This is the, the Zhualski's horse, as it's known, Taki in Mongolian. This horse is the only case of an animal that went uh, a wild horse, uh, and it's a prehistoric horse. It has an additional chromosome, it's quite unique. But uh, Zhualski was a, was a uh, uh, Russian colonel biologist uh, over 110 years ago. And he was on a biological expedition in Mongolia and they were becoming extinct. And he took six specimens out of Mongolia back to Russia. The offspring of those horses were then distributed and donated to various museums in first in Eastern Europe and then into the West. So in 1990, they started a program and they created a, a reserve where they reintroduced the first six uh, uh, horses, the Zhualski horses that were saved from extinction in Western museums and then brought back to Mongolia. That program has now well over 300 some odd horses, closer to 400, I believe. And it was well funded. The Dutch program uh, ensured their, their survival. So you get to visit these, uh, this amazing reserve it's also been an incubator for young biologists because they were so well funded that many biologists studying snow leopard conservation, uh, all the various fish species, uh, it became a sort of a center for them. So from, from, we went from the western, from the north, the lakes and rivers, the region where the forest is, the continuation of the taiga to the west, the farthest west bordering Kazakhstan, China and Russia. We went then to the central plains where the ancient capital was and the crisscross roads and dirt roads that are still used today that were part of uh, Chinggis Khan's empire. Uh, now we're in the Gobi, the south. The Gobi covers about a third of the desert and it's a unique desert. It's one of the northernmost deserts in the world. It's uh, unique in that it's only covered with dunes. About 10% of the desert itself has dunes. These are, this is a place called Molzikel, not far from our three camel lodge. In the background, you see a continuation of the tallest peaks that were in the west that we saw the tallest mountain are the Altai Mountains, so the high Altai. And they come down south and then they turn uh, uh, eastward and, and trail off. And these are the foothills of the Gobi Altai Mountains, so a continuation of that longest mountain range in Mongolia. So you'll see them. This particular range is called the Gorvin Safin, which is the, the Three Beauties National Park, also the largest national park in Mongolia, where we border. This is a famous site called the Flaming Cliffs. In 1923, there was a gentleman named Roy Chapman Andrews, who was the director of the American Museum of uh, Natural History. He was a famous archeologist and he launched the, one of the first motor vehicle expeditions in Asia and took uh, seven Dodge trucks and uh, cars and sedans and drove from Beijing into Mongolia, across the Mongolian border and then another 250 miles further north searching for the origins of man. Unfortunately, he didn't find any specimens uh, of man as he thought that that's where man may have originated. But he came up, he, he collected over 2000 different specimens of, of plant life, animals, he uh, had a pet hedgehog he took with him. 
And, uh, you know, it's amazing on the return to Beijing after they collected this, they were driving across the relatively flat steppe and he saw the sun was setting and he saw these cliffs. And as the sun set, they became brighter and brighter orange. Uh, people have compared it to Sedona, but he called it the flaming cliffs. But it was called in Mongolian, it's called Bayan Zag, which is the saxel. You'll see these little trees growing in the side of the sand. This is a unique tree. They've grown up to 12, 14 feet high. And during the Soviet period, they cut them down. The wood is one of the densest woods in the world. If you drop a piece of the wood in the water, it sinks. But it's a unique plant in that it survives in deserts. It has an ancillary plant that grows on its on its roots that it will draw water from. That will draw water from the plant. And then the plant itself will draw water back from this other plant that, that, that grows off of, the, uh, off of its uh, roots. So it's an amazing place. But Andrews made camp there. The next morning, someone, Mother Nature called and they stumbled across the first nest of dinosaur eggs intact in the world. So this became a mecca for paleontological research. And it literally is because this is all sand. It's not sandstone. So as the rain falls, calm winds, it changes and evolves over the years. But the American Museum of Natural History, where he discovered the first nest of eggs, They've been conducting con the longest running expedition. They are still there. They go every summer. I think they were delayed because of COVID last year. They didn't, they skipped one year, but that's been going on for 33 years now. And it's also where they discovered a perfect embryo, a cross section of the same eggs that he discovered, that a Andrews discovered 70 years earlier. So it's an amazing place. And uh, we, we arrange for visits there and we can arrange for that, that's the sundowners or dinners as the sun sets. So the Gobi is considered an energy center and a Shambhala. This is one of the valleys in the Gobi, also not, not probably less than an hour from the Flaming Cliffs. This is a basal gorge. It's also an amazing snow leopard habitat, this type of mountains. This is also part of the, the Three Beauties or the, the Gobi Altai Mountains. This river that carved this out in prehistoric times has a very narrow egress. So in the winter, the ice will pack up where it exits and will build up the scourge, will fill with ice, sometimes 90 feet high. And it's uh, amazing. You'll come back to this valley and, and walk in the spring up until sometimes the ice lasts till July when it's 80 degrees out. You can walk on a frozen river of ice in the middle of a desert. It's quite mystical. As I was mentioning, uh, we've been involved with snow leopard conservation. I've been personally for over 30 years and uh, I've become, I've been a conservationist my whole life. I've had the great privilege because of working with nomadic expeditions and the Three Camel Lodge to have been able to judge properties in countries like Zimbabwe, Af uh, in, in South Africa, uh, Zambia, Peru. Uh, I've even been to the Arctic Circle in February to look at an Inuit uh, tourism project. So. I've been to places that Richard Branson owned to judge them on community benefit. Uh, I've been to Peru to look at the Inca Terra properties on their conservation efforts. So uh, somehow or another over the 30 plus years, I've uh, attained some knowledge about conservation and sustainability, which I'm quite proud of. Snow leopards are amazing and unique. There are probably less than 6,500 left in the world. And the Gobi Desert now is known to become a, a population center. They're one of the highest concentrations is in a new protected area called the Tostosin. And they say there may be up to 60 adults living within a 100 mile radius of this uh, center. So it's quite amazing. Uh, I can't tell you exact location here, but this is actually less than 30 kilometers from our lodge that some of these pictures were taken. This little cub was taken last year. So we've also started, uh, you'll hear more about it with the 3K Lodge, but uh, these are some facts about snow leopards. I don't know if it's a good thing that they can't remember. There's been no ever evidence ever or a single case of a snow leopard attacking a human being. And they've come in contact with them, though they are considered the most elusive of the cat family in the world. Now, as we travel, we've traveled from the north to the west to the central plains in Karakoram, the ancient capital, and then down to the, the Gobi. The Eastern grasslands are vast. This is the beginning of the Eastern grasslands as the mountains taper off and you'll see rolling open places. You know, we have a, a saying in Mongolia that only in wide open spaces do you truly have vision. So the grasslands of Mongolia are the largest unfenced grasslands left on planet earth. The Serengeti in Africa is about 40,000 square kilometers. This is 260,000 square kilometers with no fences and wide open grasslands. 
And it's also home to the second largest herd of hoofed mammals or ungulates in the world. It's the white-tailed gazelle of Mongolia. It's, it's, uh, the white-tailed gazelle is technically an antelope. It's part of the antelope family. So only Africa has larger herds than, than, uh, of antelope than the Mongolian gazelle. They estimate the population was approximately 2.2 million of the gazelles. And they travel in large herds. You know, when we talk about the, the migration in East Africa, with the wildebeest, you'll see a million wildebeest, but it'll come over a course of a week or so. We, the BBC Planet Earth has a, a documentary they did on grasslands, one of their segments, and from a helicopter, they find a herd of almost 250,000 gazelle together. So it's unbelievable. I've made camp here, and you look off at the horizon as the sun sets, and it looks like the landscape is undulating, and you realize it's a whole herd of gazelle traveling together. So it's, these are things you can't capture on film. It's almost impossible. But these are things we take people to areas with, the I think, the highest level of comfort they, comfort they could imagine and experience these things that are truly once in a lifetime experiences. This is a small video clip uh, for us to look at. Do I have to hit this again to play it, I think? Uh, yes. So just to recap a little bit about that film, you know, you saw images there. For example, the bear, that's called the Mazala. Mazala is uh, the Gobi bear. It is the only bear uh, known to live in a desert that uh, is native to a desert. And it's a descendant probably of the Tibetan brown bear that came off of the Himalayan plateau and uh, thousands of years ago and, and migrated to, the, the, to Mongolia. George Schaller, the, the famous biologist and I had a conversation about the, the bear many years ago. He, he discovered it and was the first one to radio collar one. Also, you see a, another form of antelope called the saiga. There are only about 6,000 left in the world. That they, they, They're kind of a bull-nosed uh, animal. And they're amazing. You'll see them in the western part of Mongolia sometimes, and sometimes in the Gobi, running when they run with their head down almost like a, uh, like a rhinoceros. It's, it's it's just an amazing place. It's a different experience than Africa as far as wildlife is concerned. It's uh, it's it's not nearly as uh, abundant, but it's there. Also, Mongolia is a major migratory stop for uh, bird species. Hundreds of different species of birds that use it 
on their way from Europe to Asia. You saw white nape cranes there. I, I've been to lakes in the West and wake, wake up in the morning and see 5,000 demoiselle cranes migrating, uh, taking off from the lake. So these are things that's just hard to uh, imagine. So I also don't want to leave you with the conception that we don't have the modern comforts. This, this segment of uh, TL University is focused on the nature of Mongolia. But we've, uh, we've come a long way in the level of comfort. We can take you to these places and provide you. So you get to experience this wilderness and the, the nomadic culture and this nature and these different species. So certainly we can go to places where we'll know there's a snow leopard habitat. I'm not, it's the most elusive cat in the world, but you can find tracks, you can explore. And we have had clients, we've done special expeditions where with, in conjunction with WWF of Mongolia, and we've actually taken clients on a customized trip to track the snow leopards with the biologists that are radio collaring them. So, you know, there's a variety of things that we do. There's also this amazing capital that's gone through this transformation from 70 years of, of communism to a modern democracy after a peaceful revolution. And in the capital, you'll see young Mongolian art. I'm fortunate to be a, a board member of the Arts Council of Mongolia since it was founded uh, in, the, in 2000, I think, uh, 99, by George, uh, George, uh, 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 George Soros. And so it's been a long time and a uh, member of a lot of boards. We have wonderful museums, so with that, I think I'll, uh, I'll leave it. There are some reading materials here. And again, this is focused on nature. There are great books. You'll hear about them in the upcoming series by, by some amazing authors about Mongolia. But uh, so anything else I can offer, I'm happy to answer any Thank you. Thank you for joining Thank us. Thank you, Jalsa. I think this, you know, th as I mentioned, it's a, it's a quick, synopsis of a destination that we can go on and on for, for many hours. We had some very good questions on the chat. Thank you, Undra and Sanjay, for being so quick to, to reply. Um, I know that everybody has a, a busy schedule, but if anybody has any questions that you really want uh, Jalsa to, uh, to highlight, please go ahead and write them in. Jalsa, if you could just uh, tell us a little bit about the COVID situation. What is the vaccine rate? Uh, what is the expected date of opening for the country? And then we had a few, a few people asking also about uh, food. You know, what, what is that experience like? Well, you know, we, let's start with the COVID situation. We get daily updates. We've obviously been tracking this. Mongolia was looking forward to, we were looking forward to a, a June 1st and a June, a July, July 1st, and it's been pushed back. But the updates as of uh, June 23rd is the total cases to date are 100,000 with many, most majority recovered. The, the, the adult population, they've already vaccinated 70% of the adult population. Uh, and uh, so that's, 2.9 million. There is, uh, uh, you know, it's what's happened is they've gotten to one of the highest rates of vaccinations in the world uh, of both doses. And they're also starting, they're up to 48 or 49% of their entire population, including children 12 years and older that were approved for the vaccines. Mm -hmm. So what's phenomenal and in a bad way is that they had a surge, a recent surge. So we've had a, just Mongolia were, was almost in, through all of 2020, they went through it without a single death until I think it was November, uh, either early November of 2020. So they had one of the lowest cases in the world of, of COVID and no deaths for the longest period of time. It was amazing, but you know, with expats returning, there was a surge and then the vaccination started. So we're, we're hoping that we, we're seeing now that, that, that it's peaked and that this, the the herd immunity is going to start taking effect. So we're still watching it very closely, but we're committed to not taking our clients or putting them in any kind of risk. We want to, we're watching the Mongolian government's actions very closely. But once it's there, I think uh, we're ready to, to well, we still have travelers who are, have trips booked for this fall and are ready. And, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, I'm glad the government's got as many doses out there as they have, and they're, they're prepared to give everyone vaccinations. As far as food goes, we've come a long way. Uh, I, for example, at 3 Camel Lodge, uh, our chefs, uh, they, I've brought our chefs to the US, we've brought chefs, we've brought Michelin chefs to the Gobi Desert to train our staff. Uh, our, our chef makes the best broccoli soup in the world. We grow our own vegetables. We have an organic, it's farm to table. I like to tell people the meat they eat in Mongolia has, is non-GMO, it's, uh, it's all organic. 
I was going to say cruelty free, but they survive winters where it's minus 60. So I don't know if that's cruelty free or not. They really <laughs> open pastures. And so, you know, it, it's a whole different experience, but we, we serve everything from Western cuisine to vegan to kosher. So we've come a long way and uh, we, we take our field chefs go out on trips when we do our, our remote camps for people or set up FITs with, with customized uh, experiences. So uh, cuisine is very important. And uh, I'm proud of the Three Cam Lodge, which uh, we'll tell you about later. I built that a decade after we started Nomadic Expeditions. And we have, uh, besides the food there, which as I described to you, but we have cooking classes for dumplings, the national dish. But, uh, you know, you'll, you'll get a, obviously there's plenty of meat, but vegetables, it's amazing. Uh, you would grow Swiss chard and uh, pumpkins. Our, our chef's pumpkin pie is unbelievable. <laughs> You're making me hungry. I wanted to just highlight to everybody, for some of you that are writing that you won't be here for the next session, you might be traveling. All of the content that we produce is always available on our YouTube channel. So we will be putting this training also for you there. If you miss one of the sessions and you want to watch it afterwards, you can always go back and watch it, share it with your team, make sure that um, the information is there. I, some of you mentioned you want to reach out to Jalsa and Undra. We are more than happy to share their contact information as well. So through TL Portfolio, you can reach them directly. We want you to have access to them. They are the ones with all the knowledge and the expertise. We are just merely opening the doors to, to connect to all of you. Um, so, so please do reach out. Also, I saw that some of you wanna have a group organized if you want a special training with the Nomadic Expeditions team for your uh, agents, for your group, please do let us know. We can schedule that. Um, but I hope this was very informative. Um, we hope that you can join us for the next sessions and reach out if you have any additional questions. Um, and if you have any doubts or, or concerns, we're here to, to help. Tina, if I may add, um, sure. I, I'm sorry, if, uh, everybody who joined us, if I seemed rushed or whatever, I was under strict instructions because Tina and Undra and the whole team knows if I start telling my stories, we're in trouble. Uh, so. It's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm certainly uh, available to talk to groups or any of you if you have questions. Undra, our whole team is available and they can reach me. And if we get started, you might end up with too many stories. So we'll, we'll have to use the same techniques that Tina and Undra use to make sure I stay on track. <laughs> I've been talking about Mongolia for 32 years, but we really, uh, there's an old saying we say, it's better to see it once than hear of it a thousand times. But I certainly can talk about it for thousands of times. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. And Tina, thank you for the opportunity. And thank you, the TL Portfolio team and TL University. It's a wonderful thing. And it's, it's just great. And Sanjay, Nikita, Undra, as, as always, thank you. Thank you and do reach out. There's much more information. We just want to keep it really tight because we know we're all, you're all very, very busy. Uh, but join us for the next session. And Nomadic Expeditions team, Jalsa, Sanjay, Nikita, thank you. And to my team, thank you for putting it together. Do let your friends know and come back for the next session. It's like Netflix, you know, you have to get addicted to this, to these series. Thank you, Jalsa. Thank you. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you.